Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. General Jacqueline D. Van Ovost is one of 11 combatant commanders, currently serving as the 14th commander of U.S. Transportation Command. The TRANSCOM mission is to project and sustain military power globally in order to assure allies, deter potential adversaries, and, if necessary, respond to win decisively. Gerald Van Ovost holds a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering from the United States Air Force Academy and is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. Gerald Van Ovost earned a master's degree in mechanical engineering from California State University and has a master's of strategic studies from the U.S. Air Force Air War College. An accomplished pilot and strategic leader in national defense, General Van Ovost has more than 4,200 military flight hours in more than 30 aircraft types. It is my distinct honor to welcome General Van Ovos for her keynote address. I've long said that America is unique. Unlike every other nation on earth, we were founded based on an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We lead by the power of our example, not the example of our power. And we're part of so something so much bigger than ourselves. We stand as a beacon to the world. It's a code. It's a code. Uniquely American code. It's who we are. Thanks, Robert. What, the voice. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> hey, what a great illustration of who we are. America is uniquely founded on a great idea. And we will continue to lead by the power of our example, driven by our shared values because of patriots like you, whose logistical prowess is driving deterrence, which is foundational to national defense. Union Station is equally a unique American symbol of logistics prowess. Known as the gateway to the West, it was a throughway to more than 100,000 people per day, the highest traffic during World War II. Today, it symbolizes a gateway to the hearts and minds of our future generations. Through this symposium, what a great venue. Let me thank the association and the union staff that put, that put this together. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, so before I delve in, I want to thank uh, your president, Jason Kalin, for inviting me here today. Uh, to my fellow keynote speakers and DVs here, general officers, thanks for being here to help shape these young minds of the LOA teammates. Now, Quite an audience, isn't it? And as I survey this audience, I'm inspired to see how many folks are here. Uh, because it's a profound symbol of the larger global community of dedicated teammates who enable our national security successes. And I'm grateful to you and your families for your sacrifices. This diverse group of professionals includes our international partners, who together are critical in achieving integrated deterrence. Thank you for being here, and thanks to your families as well. Like the strength of this building, which symbolizes a beacon in unifying the East and West, it takes the strengths of all of us to be a beacon that unifies our logistics enterprise. Now today, I will share the importance of our shared values and how they underwrite logistics, which drives integrated deterrence. It recognizes the importance of respecting diversity of thought and the collaborative spirit that accelerates change for the team. I'll do that by explaining what it means to be a credible logistics enterprise that derives deterrence and recognize those who have done so recently. Then I'll delve into how the strategic environment is changing and what it means to evolve our logistics enterprise into the future. 
Now, our logistics enterprise has repeatedly risen to the challenge in providing global reach to ensure our national objectives because it's who we are. Integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do are some of the values which make the impossible possible, like storming the beachheads on D-Day, to Desert Storm, to Iraq and Afghanistan, and now the sport of Ukraine and the Middle East. President Eisenhower once said that wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics. Or, referencing the staff construct, you might say, fours win wars. <laughs> but, yeah, all right, that's right, that's right. But our credibility is also demonstrated in our agility to provide hope and relief at a moment's notice. It's flexing a muscle without making a fist. From launching aeromedical teams to assure care, a promise we keep on behalf of our service members and their families, to delivering aid like food, water, and shelter to those in need, like those in Turkey, in Syria, in Haiti, and the Middle East. To bringing our fallen heroes home, to reunite, to reunite with their families. Whatever the mission has been, together we delivered. Credibility also means that we have to make known that our pre global presence and reach is swift and precise to reassure our allies and partners and support the international rules-based order. It means that working together to develop, combine, and coordinate our strengths to maximum effort ensuring that potential foes understand the folly of their aggression. This credible logistics enterprise drives integrated deterrence. How Transcom and the, the larger Joint Deployment and Distribution Enterprise, or the JDDE, achieves integrated deterrence is through our warfighting framework. Beginning with global mobility posture, which is our forces, our footprints, and our agreements, uh, that are resilient enough to provide the Joint Force Commander with the necessary agility to maneuver at will. This deters by showing that we can deliver a decisive force from anywhere to a place of our choosing. Global mobility capacity, which comes from our multimodal lift platforms, including those from our allies and partners, and our emergency preparedness programs provided to us by commercial industry partners, that can rapidly scale to achieve national objectives. This deters by showing that we can deliver a decisive force on time. Finally, our global command control and integration ensures that we match the nation's highest movement priorities to our available capacities, like moving the president, deploying rotational or crisis units, or moving humanitarian aid. It also shapes our systems to reliably transform our data into knowledge and provide senior leaders with realistic options in time to act. This deters by showing that we can present an array of credible options for our national leaders when requested, or better put by the SecDef, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We deliver because it's who we are. It's our purpose. It's rooted in American democratic principles, founded in our shared values, our North Star. It drives the human spirit when we are hungry and wet and cold, yet the mission must be done. When I look around at the incredible missions that have been accomplished, I know it was wrought from the dedicated service of people like you. It refreshes the soul, but why talk about it? Let's take a look. We're determined to make sure that Israel gets everything it needs to defend itself, to provide for the security of its people. Already, significant military assistance requested by Israel is on the way. Back to our top story, the United States and the United Kingdom have carried out airstrikes on Houthi rebels in Yemen. This comes after the Iranian-backed militia group attacked cargo ships and tankers in the Red Sea. Transcom operates an agile and resilient logistics enterprise comprised of our military components, commercial partners, and industry teammates delivering for our nation, our allies, and partners around the world. We project and sustain the world's most capable military force.
Wow, it's the values that define us and what propels this first class enterprise to fire on all pistons to achieve this kind of success, and that's you. Where there's a need, the entire joint force comes together to get the mission done. Championing future success has always been led by innovators whose passion seized a brighter future for us because of the values they hold dear. Just like the C5 depot team from the 402nd Aircraft Maintenance Group at Warner's uh, Air Logistics Center in, in Georgia. They reduced risk to our strategic lift capability. With the help of the Defense Logistics Agency, they delivered future mission readiness by increasing depot throughput. They found ways to increase the speed and significantly reduce de depot queue, the best in six years. This returned four additional C5s to the force by the end of the year, from three in 2021 to seven in 2023. And with that, we have increased current and future readiness, which translates to more transportation options. And the Air Transportability Test Loading Activity, or ATLA, and the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center. Their engineers who determined how to fit more M777 howitzers into a C-17, giving Ukraine what they needed on 27 aircraft instead of 40. This innovation is a precision that delivers efficiency and effectiveness for the warfighter, along with a $13 million cost savings. It shows that unified values bring unified actions. Innovation like this came from unique ideas spurred from the diversity of thought and talents focused on delivering a solution to our problems. But it will take a concerted effort by all of us to rise to future challenges in this changing strategic environment. Our shared values are under attack by countries that seek to undermine the international norms which promote peace and prosperity. The increased prevalence of authoritarian aggression poses great risk to human rights, national sovereignty, and the ideals of democracy. Democratic principles and the international rules-based order that make our democracy even possible are under threat by coercive regimes. President Biden makes it clear in the national security strategy that we have entered the decisive decade. With Russia as a threat, which the president stated uh, that the stakes of which fight, uh, of this fight extend far beyond Ukraine and China as our most consequential strategic competitor. China and Russia know that power projection and logistics are critical to combined operations. They also know our relationship and our strength is both a strength and a center of gravity where friction between us can erode trust and undermine our international partnerships. So, they are preparing to deny, degrade, and disrupt all modes through all networks, making it difficult for us to defend our values. Malign actors in cyberspace pose a real and persistent threat to transcom systems. Our global enterprise of transportation and logistics services, 91% of which comes from our commercial industry during competition or day-to-day -day operations, depends on the connectivity that this unclassified commercial network provide. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of logistics data and a lot of vulnerable surface area. Competitors like China are wielding cyber capabilities targeting all of us, laying the foundation to contest logistics. FBI Director Chris Wray uh, recently warned us that China is positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and our communities. Contested logistics is also being exacerbated by the changing character of war, which includes hypersonic missiles, mass drone attacks, long-range surveillance, electronic warfare. All of this demonstrates that our competitors have unprecedented reach, showcasing the inflection point here. Home is no longer a sanctuary, we must fight to get to the fight, and that is from fort to port, port to port, and port to foxhole. Now we've been challenged like this before, but our collective values bind us together and strengthen our resolve to get through this. I have confidence that we can do it because we have you, 
our logisticians, our industry partners, and our allies and partners, the leaders to champion tomorrow's success. Good and purposeful work is an, is an infinite endeavor, as Simon Sinek might say. It means constantly adapting our capabilities to the contested environment, to project, maneuver, and sustain the joint force. And we must adapt now. I believe this takes four tenants to be ready for the future, achieving a decision advantage, push and pulse operations, precision logistics, and innovation. To begin, we must adapt now while we have the opportunity to act. We must help leaders at all echelons preserve time and create better options to deter aggression, a decision advantage. Decision advantage helps leaders gain better insights, foresights, and anticipation to improve decision quality so that we can preserve time and options. It shapes our systems, our processes, our policies, our authorities, and our outcomes to stay ahead of our adversaries. To make decision advantage effective, it takes disciplined initiative to empower the philosophy of mission command through the fog of war at or greater than the velocity, scope, and scale of the changing character of war. Because leaders at every echelon will contend with more challenges in shorter time frames than we ever have before. Decision advantage effectiveness is underscored by data delivered as a product to be curated and used by multiple customers to solve problems. When data is shared, we provide a global pipeline of information to help decision makers everywhere. And this allows us to, uh, leaders to leverage volumes of information in compressed time periods to develop better and faster starting points for predictive analytic decisions. Committed teams in this room can jumpstart decision advantage by enabling us and embarking on a new dynamic approach to logistics operations that are designed to be effective in a contested environment. Dynamic actions across all domains will be necessary to prevail in the future as we move to push resources forward before they're requested and execute pulsed logistics when the opportunities arise, what I call push and pulse. This ensures that we can aggravate to fight and disaggregate to survive. And our ability to effectively meet our mission requirements during simultaneous global challenges in a world shrunk by technologies requires the courage to tackle precision as a new measure of effectiveness. Meaning, forecasting with the requirements owner for logistical fidelity so that we can deliver together with precision. Now, it's understandable that measures of effectiveness for precision at, at, for logisticians will differ than the pilot's measures of effectiveness for precision. But on a team, we are working together to make our operations more efficient and effective. The ability to anticipate the hull and its contents without ever getting the call is our collective measure of effectiveness. As logisticians, we will need to precisely know where and when and how much we need in the future. High fidelity predictive analytics using logistics data from our repair parts to fuel to distribution cycles and our engineering capability supports decision advantage and provides the ability to push to the point of need and anticipation of the demand. How good we get at this will allow us to scale capacities at speed across multiple areas of responsibility to affect schemes of maneuver, like agile combat employment. Now, you already know that ACE in, uh, requires innovative solutions for hub and spoke execution. Requisite pro, uh, protection and sustainment are predicated on minimal force packaging maximum additive manufacturing on site, minimal signature, and maximum use of contracting to have optimal sustainment to win. For example, 3D printing can be enabled for ACE. It's shown its potential to build drones, modify gear, and improve effectiveness at the unit level. 
We need to scale this so we can work together, innovate faster, and deliver to the forward edge. If we're doing this at scale, then we need to collaborate at scale. A system like DLA's Joint Additive Manufacturing Model Exchange, or JAMX, can help. It provides a repository for users to share and modify data packages to print models from anywhere. This gives maintainers the agility to source the parts they need, like we've seen in Ukraine today. Additive manufacturing has given Ukraine the ability to print uh, 3D firing pins uh, for the 777 howitzers to quickly get them back into the fight. When parts and supplies are created at the point of need, it gives leaders at Echelon a decision advantage by freeing up our logistical capacities that can now uh, be reprioritized across the battle space. But there are other innovations that can enhance our warfighting conops, like autonomous intra-theater airlift and sea lift, improved joint logistics over the shore, small nuclear reactors for energy, and point-to-point -point rocket cargo. So, the question is, what data, systems, processes, and authorities do you need to make better, faster decisions? It's not just a challenge for the senior leaders. It's a challenge for everybody in this room. We need to hear your voices. Tell us what you need so we can advocate for you, so that we can accelerate change together. So it all comes back to you. Because only the people can bring the change and leverage emerging technology to gain enduring advantages. Your innovative thoughts are what will transform the joint force, ultimately allowing us to present ourselves as a more agile and precise formation for great power competition. There are risks to this. But indecision is a greater risk. We need to fight for decision advantage and take disciplined risks if we expect to ensure logistics is never the limiting factor to our ability to deter conflict and, if called upon, to win. So here's my final advice. Make it a cultural imperative to strive for decision advantage. It is needed at all echelons in order to scale for great power conflict and provide more time and options. Prepare the logistics enterprise of tomorrow for contested logistics in armed conflict. Prepare for push and pulse logistics. Increase our ability to precisely predict what, how much, and when. Innovate together, be bold, and challenge the status quo. Remember what the president said. This is something much bigger than ourselves. Hold tight to our values, our purpose, and our mission, and continue to lead by the power of your example. This is how we will remain competitive and keep logistics as a credible driver to integrated deterrence. Thank you for your leadership in national defense, your service, your sacrifices, and that of your families. Together, we deliver. Now bring all your questions. What do you want to know about the greatest combatant command there is out there? <laughs> As I like to say, I'm an ING command. I'm a supporting combatant commander. I support them all. We support them all. We support the joint fight every day. And we love what we do at US Transportation Command. Good Jacqueline. morning, ma'am. Our first question, how is Transcom building partners around the world? So say allies and partners, really critical. It's critical for our access basing and overflight, for our logistics sharing agreement, for our lift sharing agreements. Uh, and we could not project and sustain combat power without our allies and partners. I work with the geographic combatant commanders. Uh, I travel around the globe to try to ensure we have the, the access we need so that we can maneuver. We think about maneuver, right? If we lose the partnership of one nation, the geometry of the battle changes. And we don't get that overflight, or we can't launch logistic operations out of a certain area, 
then we are limited in the, in the approach. My job is to ensure we have multiple approaches to the problem, multiple pathways in, multiple ways to support the joint warfighter. Can I do that with our allies and partners? But what that means is we have to share more with allies and partners, and we have been on that journey. Uh, we just came out of Australia. We did a, 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 the Quint Logistics Forum, some of my Australian teammates um, here, uh, and, uh, and to talk about how we're going to ensure peace and prosperity for our nations together into the future. How do we share? We've got to break down the information barriers so we can share our planning, right? Because I really believe that you know, this is what we do. We plan. And, and sharing our plans increases deterrence. So we have been on this journey with information sharing and with strengthening our allies and partners. When I think about our most consequential theater, spending a lot of time in Australia uh, and with Japan and with you know, the Philippines and uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, we, we, we need them all, right? Um, because we are not just concerned you know, about a single, uh, you know, a single uh, concern, a single um, aggressor, right? We're thinking about peace and prosperity for everybody. And we, we try to demonstrate what democracy means and what this government means and how we like to reach out, again, with an arm and not a fist to help others. Uh, and we, I think we do that a lot with humanitarian aid when we move around. Uh, but we have to demonstrate through our actions that we are worthy and uh, a worthy partner. And I think what we've been doing that. But it's always a constant work to be done. We have to understand their perspective. What is it that they need for their peace and prosperity in their nation? And every nation is at a different level. So I went to Papua New Guinea and went to Australia, two very different nations and two very different places. But they, what they really want is, is almost the same. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks to our allies and partners. Who has oversight over all the initiatives that are in work, not just across the Air Force, but DOD? Yeah. So that's a, uh, that's a big question, right? Normally I'd say my joint, my joint staff brethren are, are, uh, uh, run that. For deployment and distribution, we have something called the Joint Deployment and Distribution Enterprise. And I am the coordinator of that enterprise. Who's in the enterprise? DLA, Service Force combatant commander force, uh, and uh, OSD, Joint Staff J4. And we convene twice a year, and we talk about the initiatives that are just going on in deployment and distribution supply. Uh, and we make sure that we're synchronized, right? That, uh, that services are, are putting together systems that will interface with our systems, because in the end, we together are responsible for end-to-end -end delivery of a part or service effect capability. And so, so it's my responsibility as the joint deployment distribution owner uh, uh, enterprise coordinator to pull people together. Now, by the mere fact I'm using that word coordinator, it, it should scare you, right? It's like, and it's, not, it's not a task, it's an ask. But more and more, we really recognize that we have been coming closer and closer together. And we use the joint staff and the JROC and the functional capability boards to ensure that all, all the services and, and the entire JDDE are developing the most consequential systems and making them open for everybody to plug into. So yeah, once in a while I'll see you know, IT systems that are being stood up for particular things within the different theaters or within uh, the services. But in the end, to me, it's all about the data. As long as we can all share that data, I don't, you can have a cop do you know, whatever you want to see, that's great, but it all ought to have a single set of truth data and that's what we're fighting for. We're finally laying in that, that foundation. We're starting to see that. Uh, and from that, we're able to get the analytical insights that are really accelerating uh, our knowledge of how we're going to be able to operate into a contested environment. So long story short is, uh, you know, we have to all work together. And I think, you know, forums like this where you have these relationships here within this service, but also the joint service, you know, reaching out and learning from them uh, because, you know, we don't have the handle on all the good ideas. And, and you know, I do find some really great ideas. Army is, uh, is the executive agent for contested logistics, uh, and they're coming up with some good experimentation, and we are absolutely plugging into that. And, and then we want to scale. We find something awesome, we want to scale to all the services and all the combatant commanders. Thanks. Thank you. How is TRANSCOM adapting for the near-peer fight? 
Yeah, we're doing a lot of exercises and a lot of analytical work uh, to try to understand what, how, what disruptions will look like. Uh, and I think we're getting some, some real world examples out there, like the Red Sea. Uh, we've been doing convoy operations in the Red Sea for our ships uh, because of the Houthis. Uh, but the Houthis will, will you know, comparatively, it's very, is a lower threat than what we might see in a great power competition where you have subsurface, surface, and air, and even space threats. So how we adapt, we're taking lessons learned you know, from our, our work with uh, supporting aid to Ukraine, where our logistics networks were targeted and attacked, our commercial partners, the same, uh, and, and the Red Sea, and taking that out and doing exercises like Keen Edge uh, out in the Indo-Pacific. We took Mobility Guardian out in the Indo-Pacific. We're taking Mobility Guardian, which was an Air Force uh, air mobility exercise, and turning that into a joint exercise. Because we know that air will not be able to do it all. In fact, as you see the hub and spoke from the air perspective, moving around parts, where we have a, the similar sea lift, fast sea lift ships are going to do hub and spoke as well. And if you don't need the parts in, in eight hours, I need you to put it on the ship, OK? Because the airplanes, we will not have enough of them to, to move. At, at, the, at the speed of the maneuver that's necessary uh, if we use airlift for everything. That's why living off the land, precision forward, uh, more prepo, and then using sea lift and the sea lift routes, the star routes the sea lift will have, will be really, really important. And so we're trying to take these lessons, turn them in, and shape the operational planning and shape the follow on exercises. As you probably know, uh, there's a series of exercises for the Joint Force coming up that we're going to be able to pull it all together and demonstrate, you know, getting after these gaps. The other thing we did, you know, besides recognizing that we need, we need to ask for space effects, we're asking for cyber effects, we're asking for J39 from an IO perspective effects. All of those effects ought to be supportive of logistics as well as any effect out there. So we're putting a demand signal on Cybercom and Spacecom uh, to have capabilities so that we can ensure that we can have precision navigation and timing, right? secure communications, modernized crypto, uh, because all of it will be needed. We cannot take a 67-year-old airplane that has no eyes whatsoever and put it into a higher risk area. We need battle space awareness. We need some secure communications as a minimum to ensure survivability. And so those are the things I'm advocating for with Congress. And that's not just for airplanes, OK, that's for ships as well, where we're bringing uh, carry-on secure communications kits for our, for our ships. And we're putting on tactical advisors on the ships as well. So that's just a couple of the ways that in deployment and distribution that we are, we are adjusting. We are nowhere near there. But I think we have a, a, a more clear. In fact, some of our analytical models are some of the best in the department with respect to the, the clear consequences of a cyber attack in a port. Uh, or the loss of a bridge, which we're doing right now as we're looking back and, at, at Baltimore, and we're thinking we're already in the analytic mode of, okay, where's the single point failures? You know, what would happen if, you know, and so how do we model that? Because we know that the logistics are going to change in Baltimore. We're going to watch that change and try to predict how we might change if we lost, well, say, Tacoma, which is a really important port for us to push out of. Thanks. For 3D printing, what are the biggest roadblocks, if any, to getting the parts approved for use? Yeah. So uh, where are my engineers? Who are those guys in here, right? So um, look, obviously, for airplanes, it's airworthiness, right? But there are some parts that are, you, know, you can sort of categorize as not necessary for that. And that's what, you, well, that's what the engineers, the hard work has to be done to say, you know, you could 3D print this type of stuff with this material. And I know AFMC is working hard on gaining more materials and more capability to be able to, to print uh, forward. And, and it's, it's got a lot of promise. And, and frankly, uh, you know, uh, industry is doing the same thing. So we want to, to latch on to what they're doing with the materials with respect to airworthiness uh, so that we can, you know, again, um, minimize the amount of actual moving um, you know, big risk kits forward of stuff. It will take, of course, uh, printers forward, which means we have to pre-deploy printers with the materials 
different types, right? So we're gonna ha you're going to have to send us that demand signal, right, on what that needs to be or through the service. And then as we work um, forward locations, how we're going to put that forward. So engineering support to ensure that we can, uh, uh, you know, create a certain part for a certain capability. Uh, material support to ensure we have the right materials forward. Because uh, it's not going to do any good if you have a 3D printer, but you don't have the type of material you need for that, you know, whatever part. And then the data. Uh, as I, man I mentioned, JAMX, that may not be the be all end all, but it's, it's, it's a way, it's one of the things we're going to get um, all the data for 3D manufacturing into a single catalog, accessible from anywhere, so you could pull it down and print whatever it needs there. And that will take time, right? Because it won't be perfect. Uh, and there'll be a lot of training that will have to be done forward on even reverse engineering of parts. But uh, those, are, those are challenges you can overcome. Uh, I mean, some of, some of your young leaders are already out there, you know, 3D printing, you know, parts for their own cars right now. So, <laughs> thanks. Thank you for taking questions, ma'am. I appreciate it. Okay, great. All right, thanks everybody. Appreciate your time. <laughs>